What is going on everyone? Welcome to another very exciting episode right here on the MI Gardener channel. I am so excited about today's episode. There's so much I'm gonna walk you guys around and show you that I just cannot wait. It's been such an eventful couple days here because we've had a lot of rain, a lot of thunderstorms, which brings in amazing nitrogen into the, into the rain. It helps just everything green up and explode in growth. And so there's a lot of crazy stuff going on here in the garden that I wanna show you guys. Um, stuff that I have not shown in, uh, in previous episodes, and also stuff I've not shown ever, firsts. We're gonna show you some firsts for the MI Gardener channel, so I'm really excited about it. But um, I did wanna answer a quick question I thought was kind of uh, interesting. It came up in, I think two videos ago, I was going through the comment section and someone said, you know, Luke, you always say that every episode's exciting. How come you say every episode is exciting? You can't possibly have every episode be exciting. Is that just a script that you go off of? And it's really not. It's really not a script. And I'll be completely honest there. I don't script my episodes. I literally go right off the cuff. I just say, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do a video on. Or I might just be out in the garden. I have my camera on me. I say, oh, that'd be a good video. Um, and so I go off of an idea of kind of what I want to show you guys. So my head stays focused. Otherwise, it's like a dog with 20 squirrels around. You know, which one do you chase? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I have an idea, but I don't go off a script. The reason why I say welcome to another amazing episode or an exciting episode or I've got an exciting episode planned or you know whatever along those lines super hyped up is because I'm always excited about my garden. So yeah, I don't I don't script these episodes and I don't script the intros. It's just always exciting. So take that for what it's worth. But anyways, all right. We're going to get off that that tangent and get on to another one. I've got some really cool stuff I want to show you in the garden. So let's get that going. All right. Check it out. So the first thing I wanted to show you guys, I actually posted on Facebook yesterday. I could not contain the excitement, so I kind of, I kind of uh, sneak peeked it over there. But our artichokes are fruiting, or flowering, I should say. Um, they actually have artichokes forming. This is a very first for us on the channel. We have never grown artichokes to full fruition, and I am just so excited about it. These ones are just starting to form. We'll leave them on here for another probably three or four days before picking them. But I cannot wait to try my first taste of homegrown artichoke hearts. They're just so delicious. I mean, absolutely the most amazing flavor ever. And when they're homegrown, they can only be better than from the store. So I am just so excited about this. And I actually, I actually did it. It's one thing that I've been, it's just on my bucket list. Um, you know, let me know in the comments box below if you guys have a bucket list and what's on that bucket list for your garden. You know, for me, this has always been on my bucket list. I've always wanted to do it because I've, I've always seen that it's possible. Uh, every time we go to um, Mackinac Island is a really good example. They actually have, there's a cottage there where they literally line the entire front of the cottage with artichokes. And they call it the artichoke house because everyone knows what they're talking about. And they just mulch them in the winter, they come back and they are perennial. But I've, every single time I've tried it here, they always die off from the winter. No matter how deep I mulch them, I just cannot seem to get them to come back. And this year was the first year we actually got artichokes to, uh, to come to fruition. Now, this is the first year we're growing them, so they're very small this year, but if we can, uh, if we can mulch them and keep them alive, the, t you know, the ticket is to keep them really healthy and get their root system established so that it comes back in the spring. But, I mean, come on, that's just absolutely incredible. I mean, I'm over the moon about that. So the artichokes are really cool, aren't they? I mean, they're just so beautiful. That's actually a flower, believe it or not. A lot of people have mistaken that for a fruit but it's not a fruit, it's actually just a flower bud that's all closed up and you eat the immature flower. It's essentially the same thing as broccoli, just not the same, it's not in the same family, but you're eating, when you eat broccoli, you're eating an immature flower bud. It's basically, well, not basically, it is the exact same thing as an artichoke. You're just eating an immature flower bud, so really, really cool. So the next thing I wanna show you is right next to the artichoke, believe it or not, and that's my very first Charleston Gray watermelon. I don't know if we're gonna get one or not, but we have one forming, and for here in Michigan, to be this early and to have a watermelon, it's kind of a big deal, because that means we have all of August to get it to mature, and that's plenty of time to make it size up, so that when it goes into September, all it has to do is ripen. I think we can do it this year. I do think we can do it. As long as no pests get to it, I think we can do it. Check it out. So there's the artichoke, and down here are my watermelon vines. They go all the way over there. They're just going crazy right now. But following this vine along, you'll see the very first Charleston Gray Watermelon. I am so excited about this. I just cannot wait to taste one of these. I've always had it on my bucket list to grow a Charleston Gray Watermelon. 
And in order to get this plant so mature, we actually had to start this plant indoors five weeks before our last frost date. So yeah, I started these watermelons five weeks before my last frost date, five weeks. I was starting in the same time that I was starting tomatoes and peppers. Now it's very ill-advised to do that for most people because they just don't have the space. But I knew I had the space because at five weeks, by the time they're ready to go outside, they're already vining. They're, they're just basically tangling everything up and it's just a giant mess. But I knew that I had to do that. I had to sacrifice a little bit of, uh, a little bit of organization for a little bit of chaos because those vines need to at least be somewhat growing and ready to go in the ground so that I have any chance of getting a ripe watermelon. And I think we're gonna do it this year. I'm very optimistic. If things keep going the way that they're going and the temperatures keep increasing the way they're increasing, I think we're gonna have a ripe Charleston Gray watermelon. I'll keep you guys posted. And I know for a fact we'll have other watermelons because there's several smaller ones that we started the same time, like the, um, the uh, black tail watermelon, the crimson sweet watermelon, and the sugar baby watermelon, all very small personal sized watermelons that we grow here in Michigan all the time because they don't take that long of a season. But the Charleston Gray, they take all of a growing season here in Michigan. In fact, they take about 110 to 120 days to mature, and that's about every day of our growing season. So, <laughs> so if everything goes right, there's a possibility. That's why I had to start them so early. So that's another first on my bucket list. We got one forming, now all we have to do is just baby it. So you gotta be careful when you're walking through this little sea of vines here, because I've got another really cool thing going. And that's my very first Prescott Fond Blanc. My Prescott Fond Blanc melon is getting huge. Absolutely beautiful. Now it doesn't look beautiful. It looks all gnarly and, and ribbed and scarred. This is a French heirloom melon. It's, uh, it's actually a cantaloupe variety, but it's, uh, it's an heirloom to France and it is absolutely beautiful. It's growing well, the vines are just incredibly healthy. In fact, these are some of the healthiest cantaloupe vines I've ever seen in our garden. So this might be a variety that, you know, again, while it's not aesthetically pleasing, I've heard it tastes absolutely delicious and the disease resistance and hardiness of this vine is worth growing. So I'm really excited about it. It's just been, it's been a champ. So we're, uh, we're really excited about this. And this is definitely the, the biggest the biggest melon I've ever grown so far, because again, our seasons are just really short here in Michigan. So you gotta, you gotta grow some, uh, some small melons if you're going to get any. But yeah, the, the vines extend all the way over there. They're just going crazy over there into the currents and growing underneath our giant uh, zucchini here. The final thing that I wanted to show you guys that I'm just so excited about, it's a first for us on the channel, is a nine foot tall tomato plant by August 1st. This is just unprecedented. We've never had a tomato plant get this tall. This is the Hartman's Yellow Gooseberry, and we've been coming out here every single day and getting handfuls of these absolutely amazing large cherry tomatoes. These are just the most incredible tasting cherry tomatoes. Beautiful in color, just a nice, vibrant, rich yellow, and uh, they're just absolutely incredible. But this plant is equally as incredible. It is an indeterminate, obviously, but I am starting to question if we should give this a new name, like a super indeterminate or something. <laughs> you know, the, the, um, I was watching uh, the, the History Channel the other day. I don't always watch the History Channel, but sometimes I'll flip it on and they were talking about super volcanoes. It's just so funny to hear these scientists that are like, we need to really dramatize a term, you know, a super quake or a super, a super uh, tsunami. They put super in front of it so people watch it, I think. But uh, <laughs> I'm thinking this, this could be a super indeterminate. Um, <laughs> let me know in the comments box below if you wanna get behind on that. But uh, I, th I think that'd be cool. I think it'd be cool to ever have everyone get behind a term and just start adopting it. Um, a tomato that grows faster than all the rest is a super indeterminate. Um, but this thing, if there was a super indeterminate, would be this. This is just the, the most incredible tomato ever. And we still have all of August, all of September, and like half of October, which is like two and a half months and it's already a foot past the furring strip. These are eight foot tall furring strips. This is just absolutely insane. I mean, this is the top of my hand and they're all the way to the top. I mean, they're, they're, it's a foot past my reaching, my reaching length. So just amazing. I mean, just absolutely amazing. So we're gonna have to figure out a way, maybe devise a way to get them taller. I don't know how we're gonna do it because I mean, there's not much things that are taller than 
than these furring strips here. So we'll have to figure out a way, because I don't want to prune them. That's the worst thing. You know, we've never had tomato plants get this tall, ever. I can only attribute it to a few things. Compost, Trifecta Plus, which is our, our all organic fertilizer that we use on all of our plants. Compost, which we make here in the garden. And uh, core gardening, which is where we actually dig a trench, put down straw, and that actually uses, or that um, actually is used as a water reservoir during the dry season. So the plants can tap into a water source even when it's bone dry out. Um, that and good genetics obviously play a huge role into how this plant has grown. So I am just stoked. I am absolutely stoked. I mean, I've never, we planted these out June 1st. June 1st, man, it's that tall already. <laughs> it's gonna be a good year, folks. It's gonna be a real good year if it keeps this up. So that's all the firsts for us today. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I just, again, I just wanted to kind of bring you guys along, show you some of the things that I've uh, been experiencing here that are exciting me. And I hope you guys are getting excited about your gardens. You know, it's something that, like I said, I get excited about this because I'm a geek. But find something that excites you. You don't necessarily have to be a geek yet. You might just be starting your garden and that might be what excites you is that you're excited to start a garden. You know, you might be having a complete failure of a garden this year, but get excited about something. Get excited about next year's garden maybe. But just get excited about something because it's so much fun. It's so much fun to come out here and, and just uh, learn new things, experience new things, and to just interact with a garden that is, uh, it's so bountiful and fun to be out here. So anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you learned something new. And we'll catch you all on tomorrow's episode. Grubby girl home.